Good morning, everybody. We welcome you to our morning service here at 10th Street United Methodist Church and hope everyone's had a good week. We're glad you're with us today. And, uh, I don't, we don't have any announcements to be made this morning that I'm aware of, so I'll uh, ask Ed to lead us in our call to worship as we begin. And if you're able to, if you'd stand with us. Let us stand together and join in our call to worship. <clears throat> We come to worship God, who has made us and knows us. We come to follow Jesus, who leads us to new life. We come with joy and knowing in Christ we have eternal life. We come to listen to the Holy Spirit, who calls us forth. May we enter this worship knowing the Spirit is alive among us. Amen. And our opening hymn is number 600. Wondrous words of life. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith. Charlie, we're keeping you in our prayers and if your eyes have been to heal up, 
Franklin, we're keeping you in our prayers that you'll uh, continue to do better. And we also want to uh, <coughs> keep Jerry and Ellen Hoden out of thrall in our prayers. Uh, Ellen's husband, Jerry, is still uh, confined to bed. He's doing some exercises that are getting him a little stronger, but let's, let's keep Jerry and Ellen in our prayers. And Don, we're remembering you in our prayers that uh, you'll continue to feel better. And uh, we're also keeping uh, Kenneth Jurassic in our prayers as he's at the uh, SP uh, nursing home having uh, physical therapy. And uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie, John's daughter, and uh, her, her kids, Allison and Tyson, they're traveling in the Midwest right now. We want to keep them in our prayers that they'll have a safe journey and a safe journey home. They're seeing a lot of America's heartland and enjoying that. So we pray for their continued enjoyment of the trip and a safe return home. And it's her birthday. Could we have Carrie's birthday? <coughs> so when you talk with her again, wish her a happy birthday for all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there any other prayer requests that you have this morning? Are there any birthdays or anniversaries coming up? Uh, a Don has a birthday. You have a birthday, Don? No, Valerie and Garrett on the way back to Georgia. Oh, Val Valerie and Garrett are traveling back to Georgia. Okay, we'll keep them in our prayers for a safe journey. We'll keep Valerie and Gary in our prayers for a safe journey back uh, to Georgia. Is he stationed at Fort Benning, uh, <coughs> John? Yeah. Okay. And we'll keep them in our prayers for a safe journey. Anyone else? Well, let's spend it. Beg pardon? Oh, yes, we definitely need rain. That's the source of constant prayer. Thank you, Don. Well, let's spend a moment in silent meditation and we can share with God whatever's on our hearts. <laughs> and then I'll lead us in a pastoral prayer and we'll join the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. <laughs> Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of this day and that we can be in your house today to uh, worship you and share our joys and concerns with you to know that you hear and understand. We ask your blessings on our church as we seek to be in service to you and our community. We ask that you be with those in our fellowship <coughs> who are ill or who have needs of any kind. We thank you that Frank and Judy are safely back home with us, and we pray for continued healing for Frank, and that you would comfort and bless Frank and Judy and the loss of Judy's sister, and give them your grace and peace. We ask that you be with uh, that you be with Valerie and Gary as they travel back home to Georgia. Give them traveling mercies and get them there safely. And we. We ask that you would bless our area with much needed running, which we so desperately need that we would see an end to this drought that is plaguing us. We pray for continued healing for Charlie, for Jerry and Ellen, for Andrew Page and his son Ollie, for Don, for Kenneth, and we ask that Franklin would continue to feel better. We pray for continued healing for Marilyn Fleming. We ask that you would bless Carrie on her birthday today and give her and Tyson and Allie a good trip and a safe return home. We pray that you would continue to be with all the other names on our prayer list and the names that are not written down or spoken aloud, but are very real in our hearts. We offer them up to you, trusting you to be at work in these situations as only you can. Bless us now as we worship you and help us to live each day as Jesus taught us to live. When he taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it is not a temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time we have a message for our
our young disciples. We're glad you're joining us with your parents today online. I brought with me a bottle of water. I'd be willing to bet that uh, you and your friends and family have been consuming a lot of these these past few weeks. Uh, we are experiencing some extremely hot weather uh, here in Texas. It's been oh so very hot, as you very well know. And with uh, so many uh, temperatures up in the triple digits, and we desperately need rain, just as we have prayed for. And one of the things that doctors and uh, uh, state officials and people we hear on the news on TV tell us, and something your parents have probably been telling you, is that it's very important to drink lots of water in this kind of weather. You know, water keeps us alive. We can only live uh, not quite a two days without any water. And water is a <laughs> important part of our of our diet, it, it keeps us healthy. You'll hear people on the news talking about the need to uh, stay hydrated. That means to drink lots of water. Water hydrates us because it replaces fluid that um, we uh, lose when we perspire and when we uh, exhale. Uh, we lose lots of fluid and we uh, need to replace that fluid we lose by drinking lots of water. Uh, water refreshes us, it nourishes us, it helps us to feel better and to stay alert, and uh, it helps us to stay cool in this kind of hot weather. You know, we also use water for cleaning things around the house and for cleaning our bodies. Uh, water, water is very much a source of life. And uh, that's why we often uh, uh, use water as religious, as a religious symbol in the church. When you join the church, we baptize you with water. Or when a baby is brought to be baptized, we baptize the baby with water. Uh, water is seen as uh, a reminder that God brings us new life. So <laughs> the next time you drink a glass of water, Give God thanks for all that water does for our bodies. And remember that God is like water and that God refreshes our souls and God brings new life to us every day. And so give thanks to God for his gift of eternal life and for the gift of water. We're glad you're here. And our next hymn is number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
see you presented. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the good gifts that you have given to us. Bless our morning offering that it may be used to further the work of your church in our community and throughout the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand and sing the doxology. Possessions were what came between him and God. 
Remember that Jesus had several wealthy people among his followers. Uh, Nicodemus, for example, and Joseph of Arimathea, who gave his own tomb for Jesus to be buried in. And Mary Magdalene was another one. Uh, church tradition wrongly portrays Mary Magdalene in the Middle Ages in a sense as being a prostitute. But many uh, Bible scholars today believe that Mary Magdalene was actually a woman of means who had the wealth and made her own business in the town of Magdalene that she was from. Because uh, Luke tells us in his gospel that Mary Magdalene and other women who traveled with Jesus and the disciples supported the disciples in their ministry out of their own resources which implied they had money and the ability to support Jesus and the disciples on their journey. So what Jesus is telling this young man basically is that following him is not something that's done in one, two, three quick easy steps. It's a lifelong commitment that touches every area of our lives. It's something to which we give our whole selves Following Jesus is a journey, a pilgrimage, a lifelong commitment. And the young ruler can't handle that. He wanted a quick fix. And he turned away sorrowful. You know, we've become a society that wants everything right now. The push button has become the symbol of our society. You know, we want uh, instant food, fast food, instant coffee, instant oatmeal. Uh, we want everything done right now. Uh, we're used to going on the internet and clicking on the right button and getting something to accomplish right then. And there's some things you can do that way. But things that are of lasting value, things that are of lasting worth, take time and commitment and effort. <clears throat> but a lot of people seem to just want the quick, easy solution. I, I'm thinking of the business executive who uh, called his secretary on the office intercom one day and said, my wedding anniversary is coming up this weekend. Uh, pick something out and have it sent to my wife. Or the child who breaks one of his toys and just shrugs his shoulders and says, oh, well, daddy will buy me another one. When I was teaching at Baylor, I pulled into the faculty parking lot one morning to go to work. And there was a young uh, freshman student who pulled into the parking lot a few places down from me. Students were not supposed to park in the faculty parking lot. They, of course, had their own designated parking lots. And a Baylor policeman who was uh, passing by saw her getting out of her car and he said, uh, Miss, if you leave your car there, I'm going to have to write you a ticket. You have to park in the student parking lot. Her response was, oh, that's okay. My daddy will pay for it. And she rushed on into the building in class. Our society often thinks that way. But things that are here to stay take time, commitment, effort. There was a man who called an automobile manufacturer one day. And he said, are you the company that advertised that you recently cut together an entire car from beginning to end in just seven minutes? And the executive who was talking to him on the phone answered proudly, yes, sir, that's us. We did it. We built an entire car in just seven minutes. And the man replied, well, I just want you to know I believe I have that car. <laughs> Things that are worthy things that last, things that will stay the course, take time. And that's the way it is with a life of discipleship, with a life of following Jesus. Um, it's that way of building a prayer life. Building a prayer life takes time. Prayer is something we practice. And the more time we spend in prayer each day, the more we practice pray throughout our lives, the better we get at it, the more natural it becomes. Years ago, when David Letterman was still hosting The Tonight Show, I was watching it one night when uh, Letterman was interviewing a world-famous golfer whose name I forget. 
And uh, he asked the golfer about his personal religious beliefs. And the golfer replied, Well, Dave, I've never been what you would call a church-going Christian, though I consider myself a religious man. When I was just four years old, my mother taught me a simple bedside prayer. And that's the same prayer I say every day to this very day. And that seemed kind of sad to me because he still wasn't playing golf the way he had played golf when he was four years old. Through a lifetime of discipline, study, and hard work, he had become one of the world's greatest golfers. In his uh, maturity, in his uh, work, work ethic, in his discipline, he had grown and matured into an adult. But in his prayer life, he was still where he was as a four-year-old little boy. And, and that, that to me seemed kind of sad. You know, uh, there, were, there were two men who were in a small boat fishing in the middle of a huge lake. When a great storm blew up, the wind was blowing heavily, the rain was coming down in torrents, and they knew they had to get back to shore as quickly as they could, but the wind was against them, and the waves were getting higher and more powerful. The tiny boat was in danger of capsizing at any moment, and so they decided that their last resort was prayer. And one of the men, as the gale wind swept around him, prayed, Lord, you know I haven't bothered you for the past 15 years. And if you'll just get us out of this mess, I promise I won't bother you for another 15 years. Now, this man had obviously missed the point of what prayer was all about. Prayer is a daily habit. John Wesley called it one of the holy habits along with Bible study and church attendance. Prayer is something we practice, that we grow into daily with God's help. There was an atheist who was uh, fishing on Loch Ness one day, when the water suddenly began to churn around him. And to his amazement, the Loch Ness monster of legend rose up beneath his boat and threw his tiny boat up into the air, turned head over tail, and he fell out of the boat and was falling down to the lake and saw the Loch Ness Monster open his huge jaws to swallow him whole. And the atheist cried out, God help me! And to his amazement, everything froze suddenly. And he heard a voice saying, You want me to help you? I thought you didn't believe in me. And the man replied, Oh, Lord, give me a break. Five minutes ago, I didn't believe in the Loch Ness Monster either. <laughs> Prayer is not something to just be turned to in moments of crisis. Prayer is meant to be a daily habit, something that's natural to us as breathing. And the more we time we spend in prayer with God's help, the more it becomes a part of our lives. And uh, it's the same way we study in the Bible. You know, the Bible is a book that is meant to be studied and absorbed. You can't master the Bible in three easy lessons. Studying the Bible is something you work at throughout your life. And the more time you spend in the Scriptures with God's help, the more familiar with the Scripture you become. You know, you could spend your entire life studying the Bible, which most of us as Christians do, and you'd still find something new in it every time you turn to it. Even the most familiar Bible stories that we know by heart, when we go back to them, we often find something new in them that we have not noticed before. Because the Bible is a book that contains the Word of God. God speaks to us through these ancient stories, through these words, and... He helps us find guidance for living these days. The Bible has consistently remained among the best sellers in the United States. When the New York uh, Book Review puts out its annual list of the best-selling books in the country, the Bible has consistently remained somewhere on that list. But even though most people own a copy of the Bible and have it in their homes, they often don't spend time in its pages. They, 
They keep the Bible around like a totem sitting on the coffee table or on a shelf somewhere. And they, they don't become familiar with its contents. They don't read and study the scriptures with God's help. And then when the, when the crisis time comes, they go to the Bible for help, but they don't really know where to look for help because they haven't spent time with the Bible and prayerfully studied it. There was a man who believed that uh, if he needed an answer to a question, he could flip the Bible open and just pop his finger down on a random page and he'd find a verse that told him exactly what to do. And one time he was struggling with a powerful decision he needed to make. He tried that. He flipped open the Bible and to a random page and plopped his finger down on a random verse with his eyes closed. And when he opened his eyes, his finger had landed on the verse that said, Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> well, he knew that couldn't be right. So he closed the Bible and closed his eyes and randomly opened the Bible again and propped prop, prop his finger down on a random <laughs> verse. And when he opened his eyes, his finger had landed on the verse that said, Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> so he said, that can't be right. So he closed the Bible again, flipped it open with his eyes closed, popped his finger down on a random verse, and this time his finger landed on the verse that said, and that thou doest do quickly. <laughs> the Bible is not a book of magic. It's not an amulet of some kind. That's like a, but not a mystical object that works magically. The Bible is a book that contains the Word of God. And it's meant to be studied and read with guidance from God. And the more we read it, the more familiar we come with it, the more a part of our lives it becomes. A pastor had gone to visit a couple in his church one day. And at the end of their visit, he asked if he might borrow their Bible so that he could read a passage of Scripture with them and have a prayer with them before he left. And the mother turned to their, her, their little three-year-old daughter and said, Honey, go into Mommy and Daddy's room and bring Mommy her favorite book in all the world, the book that she reads more than any other book in our library. And the little three-year-old obediently trotted off to their bedroom while their mother sat there smiling beatifically at the pastor. But her smile vanished when the little daughter came trotting back into the bedroom carrying Sears catalog. <laughs> the Bible is a book that's meant to become a part of our lives. They were meant to study daily with God's help. And becoming a good church person takes a lifetime of following Jesus as well. You know, some Christians in our day and age have the mistaken impression that once they walk down the aisle and shake the preacher's hand and join the church, that that's the end of the Christian journey, that's the climax of the Christian journey. But really it's just the beginning. Following Jesus is a lifetime journey. John Wesley called it going on to perfection. The idea that being a disciple is something we grow into throughout our lives. The more time we spend with Jesus, the better we come to know Jesus, but there's still more to be experienced with Jesus. Jesus always has more to teach us. He always has more things for us to grow into. There was a little boy who was starting his first day of school in the first row, and his parents had been preparing him for what a wonderful thing school was and how much he was going to enjoy it. They told him, you're going to meet lots of new people. You're going to meet new friends. You're going to have teachers who will teach you wonderful things. You're going to enjoy it so much. So when the first day of school came, his parents helped him get dressed in a new suit of clothes they had bought him. His mother packed his lunchbox for him. And off he went to school, <coughs> excited to be going to school. Well, he came home at the end of the day and his parents fixed a snack and a glass of milk for him. They asked him about his, his day at school. He said, oh, just like you said, it was a lot of fun. I made some new friends and the teacher taught me a lot of good things. I enjoyed it. Well, he went to bed that night and his mother woke him up at 6 o'clock the next morning. 
And he asked his mother, Mommy, why are you getting me up at 6 in the morning? And she said, well, dear, you have to go to school today. And the little boy said in amazement, again? <laughs> and his parents had to lovingly explain to him that getting an education was not something you accomplish in one day. It takes years of study and learning. It's a journey. <clears throat> and even so, following Jesus is a journey. Ernest Hemingway was one of the great writers of uh, the 20th century. And in 1954, <coughs> Hemingway won the Nobel Prize for Literature. One of his works that was cited was The Old Man in the Sea. In The Old Man in the Sea, Hemingway tells the story of a Cuban fisherman named Santiago who has gone for 84 days without a catch. Finally, on the 85th day, Santiago, who is an elderly man, goes further out to sea than he has ever gone before. And he catches a giant 18-foot marble. A horrific struggle ensues between Santiago and the great marble that lasts for three days as Santiago tries to reel the great fish in. By the end of the third day, he subdued the great fish. His hands are torn and bloody. His body's aching all over. He reels his catch in, and of course, the great marlin is too big to fit into Santiago's tiny boat. So he lashes the marlin to the side of his boat and heads back to shore, triumphant in his victory. But on the way back to shore, the sharks come and they feed off of Santiago's great catch. And by the time he gets to the shore, all that's left of his great victory is a skeleton. In a way, the story's an ironic parable of Hemingway's own life, because seven years after he received the Nobel Prize for Literature, Ernest Hemingway committed suicide. His earlier literary successes had somehow withered and he didn't know how to deal with the emptiness he felt in life. Sadly, some people come to Jesus like the rich young ruler, full of excitement, knowing that Jesus has the answers. They have a warm encounter with Jesus. But then somewhere along the journey, they begin to think it's too difficult, and they turn away sorrowfully. Jesus wants us to follow him throughout our lives, daily. As we live our lives with Jesus, he's with us in the good times and the bad times. He speaks to us and guides us. He speaks to us through scripture. He speaks to us through our gatherings and worship. He speaks to us through good Christian friends that help us along the way. The journey is worthwhile. It's the greatest adventure in the world. And Jesus calls us to be a part of it. Let's follow him all the days of our lives. Praise be to God. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 172, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Let's all stand together and sing.
the love of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace and stay safe.